a child. Steve heard that that movie, Ark of the Crew, was needed to teach him that. The word of the dog. It's a dog who goes on this adventure. It's because God did it. Didn't really turn to see the YouTube. We'll see it. It's like, okay, you got too much going on. You have too much going on. But it's like, as long as the dog lives, that's all that counts. Welcome to church this morning. So this is Palm Sunday. We are going to revel in a day that we are praising our God. So this morning, we need some participation. So first, you see this and this. We're going like...
Good morning. Before you have a seat, turn to someone and welcome to church this morning. You may be seated. It's good to be here this morning, isn't it? All right. I like the teens up front here. It's great to have these young ladies up front. Um, nice and alive. Forced Frank to have to sit in the very, very front row. <laughs> That's great. Probably a little dusty on that front pew because no one usually, usually sits on, on the front pews. But it's good to move around. That's right. Well, it's welcome this morning. It's great to have you here this morning as we come to celebrate Palm Sunday, as we sing praises to our King, the one that's worthy of our worship. Um, grab your bulletins. There's a lot going on this week in the life of the church. You can see Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. we got stuff going on every week this week. Um, so a great prayer list for you to be praying about different things that are, that are going on in the life of the church. Um, this morning, right after church, um, I would like to meet with all of those who have expressed interest in, in baptism. April 7th, we're going to have a baptismal service. And um, so a quick meeting right after church in the room across from the drinking fountain, um, right after church. Um, the extravaganza is this Saturday. And so you see there's a couple of different times during the week where help is needed. Uh, Monday at 11 o'clock. Um, you're not working and got some spare time filling the Easter eggs, and then on Friday at 1 o'clock to set up the church for the different things that are going on, and then the extravaganza um, on Saturday as well. So there's a sign-up sheet. I'm sure that we're still needing some volunteers, and even if all the list is filled out there, put your name down next to somebody else that has signed up for that slot or that, that thing and, and come and, and be a part of the extravaganza, be praying, uh, be inviting people to come to that. Also, um, with this being Holy Week, uh, we have a service on Thursday, uh, Monday, Thursday at 6.30, uh, a time of just coming and um, uh, we'll be reading some scripture, uh, sharing um, some thoughts on that, but really spending some time in prayer. Um, one of the things, Monday, Thursday, right, we think about communion, we think about some other things, but one of the things that, that really jumped out at me this year in, in reading through the different gospels and Monday, Thursday is, is how much time Jesus spent in prayer. Um, on that day um, all those years ago. And so we'll be spending some time in, in prayer um, on Monday, Thursday. Next Sunday, uh, we will not be having Sunday school classes, um, but we will be having an Easter breakfast. And should I tell you what we're having or not tell you what we're having? Yeah, some of you know what we're having because you have um, been asked to bring your waffle maker. So we're, make, we're having homemade waffles. Make your own waffles. Um, so after you have your egg hunt with your kids, your grandkids, or whatever, come um, during the normal Sunday school hour from 9.45 to 10.45. And um, as long as we don't trip all the breakers from all the hot irons, um, it should be kind of quickly through the um, and uh, have a good time of fellowship as well as some, some good food. 
Also, don't forget um, in your bulletin um, for one last Sunday is, is finding your seat at the table. Back there we have a table and different ways of being able to serve, right? And everybody has a place at the table. If you were like my family growing up and, and when our kids were at home, everybody had their place at the table. And when it was time to eat, we went to our table and our spot at the table. And everyone has a spot at the table of, of um, gifts and talents that God has given you that you can use to serve um, your church, right? Because we as a church can only do what we as a people are willing to do and willing to volunteer to do. And so um, this little uh, survey can help uh, the committee figure out what your gifts and talents are and, and um, help find a place at the, at the table for you to be able to, uh, to serve. So fill that out. Um, there's a little uh, tray on the back by that table that you can uh, fill it out or, or an email went out this week. You can fill it out online as, as well. There's other things that are happening in the life of the church. Uh, make sure you hang on to your bulletin to see what's going on and to be able to participate um, in those different things. Well, yes, this morning is Palm Sunday, and uh, we've come uh, every week, but especially this week, right, to focus on Christ and what he did for us and to sing his, his praises and to give him praise for all that he has done for us. So let's just bow for prayer. Father, Certainly there's lots of things we have to complain about and to be frustrated about and discouraged about. But Father, this morning we focus on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. We focus on you, the one that over and over and over again, Scripture tells us and our experience tells us that you are worthy of our praise. And so this morning, Lord, we give you praise. I, I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to focus in on you. In our Sunday school class, we were talking a little bit about so many thoughts pop into our head in any, any given moment, in any given day. Uh, but Father, I pray that this morning that we would choose to focus on those thoughts that are pure and right and lovely and praiseworthy. Because Lord, as we come, come together from all kinds of weekends, all kinds of weeks, all kinds of backgrounds, Lord, as we sit at your feet, I thank you that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. As we sit at your feet, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning. Lord, we, we need a fresh touch from you. And as we just continue praising you in song and in scripture reading and, and diving into some passages of scripture, Lord, would you speak to us? People here have, have chosen to be here this morning. They could have chosen to be many, many, many other places, but they've chosen to be in your house. And so, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Would you just speak to us this morning? Help us to take that next step in our spiritual journey with you to draw us closer to you. We just praise you this morning, Father, and I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand as we just continue to worship in song this morning. Sing to the King who
one of the phrases in that song talked about the kids are dismissed to head down to junior church. Talked about the rocks crying out, right? In just a moment, we're going to read that passage in Luke chapter um, 19, right? But the joy in that, the, one of the phrases in there, but that joy is mine, right? The rocks and the hills and all that would love to be able to praise the Lord, but the joy is ours. I trust that you are stepping into that joy of praising the Lord. Well, turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, we want to read the Luke's account of the triumphal entry. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 28. And this morning we're continuing our sermon series on call to more. And this morning we're called to more praise. And we certainly see that in this passage of Scripture. And then we're going to be looking at Psalms chapter 71, verse 14, um, where the psalmist talks about praising God more and more. But in Luke chapter 19, verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went up on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. Right? That gentleman, we don't know his name, but that gentleman had a seat at the table. Right? He had something that the Lord could use. You and I have something that the Lord can use. He found his seat at the table. You have a seat at the table as well. I fit that in, didn't I? But the Lord needs it. What are you hanging on to? What have you tied up that the Lord needs you to use it for his honor and his glory? Verse 32. Those who were sent ahead went and found it. I already read that, didn't I? Verse 35. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he had come near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Father, as we dive into your word, as we unpack this idea, this truth from your word, that we need to be praising you more and more. Lord, just speak to us. We sense your presence. You are here. The Holy Spirit, we just give you permission to continue to speak to us. In your name I pray. Amen. So right, we've talked about call to more prayer. We've talked about call to more living a life of, of holiness that pleases God. We've talked about call to more faith. Last week we talked about call to more love. And this morning we want to talk about called to more praise. And all through Scripture... There is an expectation, there's an expectation of praise. Right? In this triumphal entry, in, in this account, Luke's account that we just read, right, there is an expectation. Jesus had an expectation that his disciples would be praising him because when the Pharisees rebuked Jesus for, for what his disciples were doing, right, he said, hey, listen, if they don't praise God, then the rocks will. Throughout Scripture, we see that our words, your words, need to be praising God. Your words should bring praise to God. Psalms 34, 1, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak His praises. Psalm 71, 8, my mouth is filled with your praises, declaring your splendor all day long. Not only do our words need to be giving praise to God, but so do our actions. Our actions need to be praising God. In Psalms, or Matthew chapter 5, right, verses 16 through 18, Jesus talks about being salt and light. And what's the purpose of being salt and light? So that people will praise your heavenly Father. And in Psalms chapter 71, verse 14, reminds us of this expectation. In the same way, oh, it's on the screen overhead. We can read this together. Let's read Psalm 71, 14 together. But as for me... 
I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. A little bit later, we're going to look at that, right? I praise you more and more. And out of that praising comes hope. We live in such a hopeless world. We have so many hopeless things in our life. But as we praise him more and more, we can have hope. So as a follower of Jesus Christ, right, do your words, do your actions bring praise to Jesus? Another thing, right, just a couple of things before we kind of get into the heart of the message, right? Praise is more than just a church thing, right? Praise is more than just a church thing. Praising God is not something that should just be relegated for Sunday morning from 11 to 12. Right? It's, it praises more than a church thing. Praise to God is more than just singing songs. Praise to God is more than just listening to praise music and worship music. Praising God should be something that's continually, a, a daily thing, a moment-by-moment moment thing. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Right, we could spend a lot of time unpacking just that verse to continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Right, just that phrase, a sacrifice of praise, I'm not sure what comes to your mind when you think about that, but for me, sacrifice means it doesn't always come easy. Right? Even in the difficult times, we can praise God. We offer Him continually a sacrifice of praise. Psalms 145.2, I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Then Psalms 119, the psalmist says, seven times a day I will praise you. Right? And there's some debate exactly what the psalmist is saying there. Was it literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Okay, seven times I praise you. Now I'm done. Or was seven talking about the perfect number and, and just that continual sacrifice of praise? But, but nonetheless, re reminding himself and reminding us, right, the sacrifice or praise is, is more than just something that you do in the temple, more than something you just do when you are in church, something that you do more than just when you are with other Christians. And this whole thing of praising God more, we all have work to do in this area. So what percent of your talk is praising? What percent of your talk is complaining? We need to be praising God more and more. And I'm sure there was a lot of complaining Friday and Saturday, except for Holly O'Hare, because she loves the snow no matter when it comes. But there was a lot of grumbling and mumbling, myself included, right, with, with the snow this time of year. And we know it comes in March in central New York. But, but what percent of, of my talk, what percent of your talk is praising God? What percent of my talk and your talk is complaining? Right? It's so easy to be quicker to complain and see the negative than to praise God for who he is and what he's doing. And another question that I want you to be thinking about, because I've been convicted of this myself this week as I've been preparing for this message, what percent of your praising is in your head versus being verbalized? What percent of your praising God is just up here, which that's good, that's good, but Scripture over and over talks about our praising God needs to be verbalized. Psalms 119, 171, my lip overflows with praise. And then I... I, I was reminded of the parable, or not the parable, but the, the story of Jesus healing the ten lepers. Right? Many of you know the story, right? These ten lepers come to Jesus, and, and he asks them to be healed, and, and he heals them and tells them to go to the priest and, and um, you know, to show that, that you're healed. And how many come back? One. One comes back. And what was Jesus' response? Jesus' response was, was there no one else to give praise to God. There's no one else other than this Samaritan, right? Seemingly all the other nine were Jewish people, Jewish men. 
And only one comes back, and that's a Samaritan. And, and Jesus says, was there no one else found to praise God, to give God praise? Now, I am almost 100% sure. I mean, I wasn't there, nor was I in their head. But I am almost 100% sure that those nine were very thankful to God in their head, very thankful to Jesus in their head that they were healed. Because if we know anything about leprosy and, and that time in the, the culture there, it was, was a horrible thing to have. It was almost a death sentence. And yet, Jesus is reprimanding them, saying, listen, it has to be, praising God has to be more than just in your head. We need to verbalize it. Right? We all have work to do in this area of praising God. So why praise? Why do we need to praise God? Well, one, the Bible commands it. The Bible commands it, right? Again, the triumphal entry. Jesus said, hey, if the people don't cry out, the rocks are going to praise me. Psalms 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If you're not sure the person sitting next to you, just stick your hand over their mouth. Are they breathing their nose? Are they breathing? If they have breath, then they're supposed to be praising the Lord, right? Let everything that has breath. Psalms 147, that psalm begins with the phrase, praise the Lord, and it ends that psalm with praise the Lord. And when you look at it in the Hebrew, that is not just a statement. The way it's written in Hebrew, it's not just a statement. It's a command. It's, the, it's in the imperative form. It's saying you have to praise the Lord. You need to praise the Lord. It's a command to praise the Lord. It's what we as Christ followers are called to do is to give God praise. So the Bible commands it. You and I, we were created to praise Him. Isaiah 43, 21 tells us that God created us to praise him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We're created to praise him. As believers, as Christ followers, as Christians, we were created to praise God. And really, life on earth... A couple of those guys this morning were, were talking about this, right? That life on earth is, is really practice for heaven because that's what we're going to be doing in heaven for eternity. We're created to praise him. And then thirdly, he and he alone is worthy of your praise. God is worthy of our praise. That's why we need to be giving him praise. John's vision in heaven in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. He talks about what was being sung and what is being sung in heaven, worthy is the Lamb. And then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, he says this, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Right? We, he alone is worthy of our praise. So the focus, of the, I want to focus the rest of our time this morning on, on what does praising God do for us? Right? There's... God is worthy of our praise. We were created. We're called to praise him. But praising God does something for you and I. And one of the things it does is it deepens your intimacy with God. Right? Praise draws you closer to God. Psalms chapter 22 verse 3 tells us that, that God inhabits or he lives in the praises of his people. Psalms 104 or 100 verse 4, that short psalm that talks about praising God and worshiping God, tells us that, that the entrance to the presence of God is through the gates of thanksgiving and the courts of praise. And so it deepens our intimacy with God as we praise God. As we begin to praise God for who He is and what He's done, it draws us closer to God. It kind of gets our eyes, and we'll talk about this in a moment, gets our eyes off ourselves and onto Christ. It, it, it realigns us because it's so easy for us to get God off the throne of our life, right? But, but through praise, it deepens our intimacy with God. It realigns us with God. It's so easy to become self-centered and self-absorbed in this selfie world that we live in, right? It's easy to take things for granted. But praise recognizes the character of who God is, right? That he's faithful, he's gracious, he's loving, he's kind, 
He's slow to anger. He gives good gifts. He's powerful. He's ever-present. His promises never fail. And on and on we can go, right, about the characteristics of God. And as we praise him, we begin to recognize the character of God. So praise, it deepens our intimacy with God. Praising God also, it lifts our eyes off of the junk and onto Jesus. Right? It, it lifts our eyes off of the junk of this world and the storms and the discouraging things and the depressing, depressing things and the problems that we have in life and the, the uncertainties of life and, and the hurts and all of those things. Because when we focus on the junk of this world, when we focus on our problems, when we, we focus on all the discouraging things, what then tends to come out of our mouth? Complaints, right? Grumbling, murmuring, complaining, all of those things. But as we praise the Lord, because remember, sometimes it's a sacrifice of praise. Right? It begins to get our eyes off of all of those things and begins to get our eyes on Jesus. And, and again, this is, this is not a... a 2023-24 problem, right? I mean, this is a this is a mankind, a human human being problem because you you read Exodus and in the in the Old Testament and Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, right? You read that and, and the Israelites, we're like them, they're like us, however you want to phrase that, right? I mean, they were constantly focusing on the bad things. They were constantly focusing on the difficult things. They were constantly focusing on the things they think they didn't have, right? I mean, God miraculously brings them out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea, and he's feeding them. And what do they do? They complain and murmur, right? Oh, we don't, we're just, we don't have any food. So God gives them bread and, and the manna. Oh, we're so tired of manna, right? If we could just go back to Egypt. Really? We just go back to Egypt. We had all the food we could eat. Really? Right? And, and when we focus on the junk of the world, we just begin to complain. But when we praise God, it lifts our eyes off of the junk and on to Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 27. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord must hate us. Right? I mean, they were just looking at all the junk in their life. The psalmist in Psalms 106, verse 25, said they grumbled in their tents. And then the psalmist tells us the rest of that story, right? They grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord. So complaining, grumbling, and murmuring can lead to disobedience if we're not careful. But as we praise the Lord, in spite of the hardships, in spite of the difficulties, it lifts our eyes off of the junk and onto Jesus. Again, in the account of the triumphal entry, look at, look at um, Luke chapter 19, verse 37. The end of verse 37, Luke in his account gives us the, the reason why people began to praise Jesus. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And, and some of the other gospel writers tell us some of the other things that they were singing and saying about Jesus as he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Well, Luke gives us the reason why they were praising the Lord. What was it for? For all the miracles they had seen. Where was their focus? Their focus was on Jesus, right? As they were praising the Lord, did the Romans still rule over them? Yup. Were the taxes still high? Yup. Had anything changed in their life situation? Probably not much, unless some of them had obviously been healed by Jesus and all that. But mostly their, their life was the same, but they were focused not on the junk, but they were focused on Jesus. And as they did that, they gave him praise. Their eyes were off their problems and onto Jesus. Right? Praising God helps us rise above the discouragement and the depression that settles on us when we focus on the junk of this world and in our life. Another thing is, is that praise is a powerful weapon in spiritual warfare. It's a powerful weapon in spiritual warfare. Right? Praise invites God's presence, and when God shows up, Satan is defeated in our life. In Isaiah 61, verse 3, it talks about God giving us a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And I was, again, thought some this week about that phrase, sacrifice of praise. Then I got thinking about that terminology, a garment of praise. A garment of praise. 
And I hadn't thought about this in forever. But as I was thinking about that, a garment of praise, this mental picture from when I was a kid came to my mind of my, my grandfather Chapman, Papa Chapman. He was a pastor. I'm, I'm so glad things have changed. I know some people think, oh, we need to go back to good old days. But, but I, I honestly cannot remember my grandfather wearing anything but a white dress shirt and black pants. He was a preacher, right? That's way back in the day. That's seemingly any time I can remember my grandfather, he had on a white shirt and black pants. So he also owned a pair of coveralls, not overalls, but coveralls. You know what I'm talking about? Right, not just not just the bibs, but coveralls. But I also remember him in his white shirt and his black pants, putting on coveralls to go out and do some work. And what did those coveralls do? They protected his clothes, right? They protected that white shirt that I'm sure my grandmother had to clean many times because it got dirt and oil and all those types of things on it, and those black pants and all that. But that that coverall covered over his clothes and protected his clothes. A garment of praise is kind of like that coverall that protects us from Satan's attacks. A, gover- a, a garment of praise that covers you, it protects you. It protects you from the weather, it protects your good clothes, those coveralls do. And praise protects us from the attacks of Satan. Right? As, as he puts those, we were talking again in Sunday school class this morning on topic is forgiveness, and we were talking about, right, that the Satan puts a lot of thoughts in our heads, and we can't control what's the thoughts that come into our head often, but we can choose what we think about, right, and praising the Lord, can, can we can choose to do that when negative stuff comes in, when discouraging stuff comes in, when, when we begin to go down that path, praising God is a powerful spiritual weapon because it protects us from the attacks of Satan, right, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, there's a story of, in, in the Old Testament that, that the Judah, the army of Judah, a, a great army was, was, the Scripture calls it a vast army, was coming to attack Judah. And they didn't know what to do. They were afraid. They didn't know what to do. But they at least were smart enough to go to God. And, and they began to pray, what are we supposed to do in, in, in all of this? And God directed them through some various things to trust him. And then God gave them a rather strange Thing to do. Get the army ready. I'm, I'm, I'm going to fight this battle for you. Just trust me. But what I want you to do is put some men in front of the army to praise me. I'm sure there wasn't too many people that volunteered for that job, right? <laughs> to go out into the battlefield in front of the army. But that's what they did. They got some, they got some men, they got some people, and, and they, they begin praising God as they begin heading out to this, this valley where, where the battle is going to take place. And you that know this story, right? When they finally get to the battlefield, what do they find? Nothing but dead bodies, right? As they were praising God, God caused some confusion among the other, um, the enemy, and they began fighting among themselves. And, and when Judah gets to the battlefield, there was nothing but dead bodies, and same with you and I, as we praise God for his nature, as we praise God for his goodness, his blessings, his work, right, we defeat Satan in our lives because praise protects us from the attacks of Satan. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, they, meaning the people, overcame him, meaning Satan, and won because of the blood of the Lamb and by telling what he had done for them. As they shared, as they witnessed, as they testified, as they praised God for what he had done for them, they overcame Satan. Another thing that praising God does for it, it renews and refreshes us. As we begin praising God, we begin to change our focus, and the focus brings hope. We read earlier together, Psalms chapter 71, verse 14, that says, I will have hope. I will praise him again and again. And I would encourage you to take some time today or, or this week to go back in Psalms chapter 71 and, and, and look at that a little bit closer. Because in that psalm, the psalmist is facing some difficult situations. Verse 1 says, don't let me be put to shame. Verse 2 says, rescue me, deliver me. Verse 4 says, deliver me from the hand of the wicked. But in the midst of all of that, the psalmist says, listen, I have hope because I'm going to praise God more and more. 
Out of praising God comes hope. It renews and refreshes us. Right? Praising God may not change your circumstance, but it will change you. It will change your outlook on life. It will change how you are looking at life and how you are looking at situations and recognizing that God is in control. Praising God, it will re- replenish and re- re- releases a fresh faith in, into your, your spirit right? that replaces doubt, that will renew courage, that will replace the fear and, and give you a great calm that replaces that anxiety as we praise God. It changes us. It may not change our circumstance. And then lastly, right, it pra- paves the way for God's power to be displayed. Praising God unleashes the potential for God's power to be revealed in your circumstances. Again, we have that example in Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas are in jail. Right? They've been unjustly accused of something and been, been thrown in prison. And after that, it says that they were severely flogged in the belly of the jail, chained. What does Scripture tell us that they're doing? Praising God. They're praising God. And praising God unleashes the way for God's power to be displayed in our lives. And, and the rest of the story talks about that God sends an earthquake, right, and, and releases them, frees them from prison. None of the prisoners escape. Paul and Silas make sure none of the prisoners escape. And as a result, right, the jailer and his family accept Christ. Would the same thing have happened if Paul and Silas in their cell were grumbling and complaining about how unfair life was? I don't know. We don't really know. But I would venture a guess, probably not. As I was thinking about that this week, then the Holy Spirit put another thought in my head. How many miracles, how many displays of God's power do I miss because I fail to praise God even in the bad times? It's just second nature to complain, to grumble, to mumble. But praising God, it has the potential to unleash God's power at work in our life. So the bottom line is, right, praise is a choice. Praise is a choice. It doesn't depend on your feelings. It doesn't depend on your circumstances. Praising God is a choice. And the passage of Scripture we've looked at many times, Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. As Habakkuk talks about all the things that were wrong in his life, the, the olive trees weren't producing any olive, the fig trees were, were empty, there was no cattle in the stall, there was no sheep in the pen, Right? I mean, that's pretty bad if you're a farmer. Something hasn't gone right if you're a farmer and you start talking about all those things. It's not very good when you're an agricultural system and there's no olives and there's no figs and there's no sheep and there's no cattle. Something's wrong. Something's not going well. It's it's a bad day. It's a bad season. But Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. He's choosing. He's choosing to praise God. Yes, we can always, you can always find something to complain about. Yes? Sure. Turn the TV on. Watch the news. Scroll through your news feed. Pick up a phone and call somebody. You can always find something to complain about. And we do. We do. But yet, the other side of the coin is just as true. But we can always find, as a believer, we can always find things to praise God for. So really, the, the choice is mine. The choice is yours. Will you be a grumbler and complainer? Or will you be a praiser? Not an, an appraiser, but a praiser, right? The reality is we have so much to praise God for. And may praising God be more and more on your lips. Not just in your head, but on your lips. The Duke of Wellington, the the British military leader who defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, was an extremely difficult officer to serve under. He was brilliant, 
but he was so demanding of his soldiers. He rarely gave any of them compliments. History tells us that one time he referred to his own soldiers as the scum of the earth. What was it like to serve under him? But many, 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 many years later, as he was uh, too old to serve in the military, and, and he wasn't quite on his deathbed, but he was, he was getting up there, someone asked him if he would do anything differently if given another chance at life. So here's somebody asking this general who defeated Napoleon and was a, a brilliant military leader if he, would do, if he had the chance, would he do anything over again? And you know what he said? I'd give more praise. I'd give more praise. Now, he was talking about giving more praise to people, which is, which is what we need to do. But we also need to give more praise to God. May we praise God more and more. May we give God praise as long as as we have breath. I just want to take a moment this morning and just share a praise. So I've been feeling a little overwhelmed um, here in the last week and looking forward to what I have on my plate and with the busyness of this week and year-end stuff, the Wesleyan Church, our year ends in the end of April, so I have all these reports to do and all these committees to do, and, and um, uh, obviously every Sunday morning I have to get up here and say something that's intelligent and hopefully worthwhile, and, and um, uh, I have no clue where I'm really going after Easter, and um, so I've been feeling very, very overwhelmed, and, and um as I've shared in the past, right, I have some guys come Saturday or Sunday morning and bright and early, and, and we pray, and I was just sharing with them a little bit, and, and just kind of the weight off my shoulder as, as they were praying for, for me. Um, and, and then this morning, um, as Michelle, my daughter, came in to get ready for a worship team practice, um, not knowing all of this other than knowing her dad's a pastor and what Easter brings and, and all of that, um, she said to me, would you like me to do the youth lesson on Wednesday, right? Not knowing all of what's going on and just the sense of overwhelming that I have, but just so thankful and grateful for the Lord's work in small things, right, as well as big things. And just one thing off my plate that I don't have to stress about this week. Um, and um, God's good. And all the time, God is good, right? So we have many things to thank him for. And I would encourage you. I know it's noon. But I would encourage you this morning, even before leaving, right, to find someone Share with them a praise, something that God has been doing in your life that you have reason to give him praise because we need to give him praise, what? More and more, right? It's our choice. It's our choice, right? We can choose to praise him or we can choose to grumble and complain about our situation or we can choose to, to be uptight and anxious and overwhelmed like I was feeling rather than giving him praise and thanks. So, Father... You are a good God. We don't deserve your blessings. We don't deserve all the things that you do for us and that you give to us and that you point to us in our way. But thank you. Forgive us for those times where it's just human nature and it's so easy to complain about things rather than to see how you are working. Passage in Luke reminds us that they were praising God because of the miracles that they had seen. That means their eyes were fixed on you, not just on their circumstances, not just on all the problems that they had. And there was many being a Jewish person in that day. And so, Father, help us to get our eyes off the junk of this world and onto you, recognizing the power that's there, the protection that's there as we praise you, the intimacy that grows deeper and our walk grows deeper with you as, as we give you praise and thanks. And not just in our head. But I pray this week, Father, that, that we would verbalize our praises. 
yes, it's wonderful that we think about them. It's wonderful that we, we repeat them in our head. But man, there's just something about verbalizing it. And your word reminds us the power of that. And so help us to verbalize our prayers. Again, we don't deserve all of your blessings. But we thank you for the little things, the way we see it work, as well as the big, big things. But you are a good God. And that goodness continues to follow after us. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand as we close our service this morning. that this week. May we sing, right? Not necessarily sing, but may we share the goodness of God. Not just in our heads, but in our lips. Just a reminder right, of all the things we have going on this week. Um, and right after church, in the room across from the drinking fountain, um, is uh, 
have a meeting for anybody that wants to be baptized on, on April 7th. So, Father, as we leave this place, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all the things we have to give you praise for. And may more of what's coming out of our mouth be praising and less complaining. May more of what's coming out of our mouth, not just in our head, be about praising you this week because you are so, so good. In your name I pray. Amen. We are dismissed.